So I have back-to-back calls from 8 a.m. until it was like 12.30. And by like 10 a.m., I started having contractions. And I'm like, okay. So I'm thinking maybe it's Braxton Hicks. I had a, I was induced the first time. So I'd never been in labor. So I don't really know what it feels like. And I'm there and I'm in my meetings and I'm literally having contractions. I'm still talking to people. And I'm like, now I'm timing them. I text my husband. I'm upstairs. He's downstairs. Ah! <laughs> and I'm like, I think I might be in labor. He's like, no, no, you're fine. It's like, it was like, it's pro- we have the doctor's appointment at one. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you'll be fine. I'm like, all right. Yeah, it's probably Braxton Hicks. I'm like, yeah, I, I think so too. They're getting worse. They're getting worse. By the time my final call happens at 1230, I'm in like immense pain. I'm still talking on these calls. And I'm like, yeah, I, I remember telling the person, like, I think I might have a kid today. They're like, really? I'm like, I don't know. So I get to the OB appointment at one and she's like, okay, what's going on? I'm like, it's a little bit of an active day. She does the exam. I'm four centimeters. Hey! <laughs> Welcome to 99 Humans. My name is Jeff LaCusta, curious coach and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, striving to understand how little things generate big impact. And I'm Nadia Carta, tech executive and lifestyle coach with a mission to transform lives and corporations by kindling hearts to generate a zeal for life. Each week, we investigate stories about the human side of leadership to re-energize your spirit and help you become a stronger leader. Because the reality is that leadership is messy, goofy, challenging, but always human. Thanks for spending time with us today. Let's dive in. So I'm going to kick us off because I met Ashley in a customer success conference and I was immediately amazed by her persona, who she is, her job, and her mission. So how about we start with one of our most preferred questions, which is, what are you up to lately, Ashley? Yeah, so mostly work. Um, I, I have two little girls, which is going to be the, the big piece of my story. Um, so similar to you, Nadia, but... Um, yeah, so I run customer success, um, we're a waste software company. And so mostly I'm just traveling right now. Um, so for the past 10 weeks, I've been traveling every other week. So I'm finally, uh, slowing down a bit, but I've been in India visiting our development team. I've been all over the country, um, visiting our customers. Um, and then in LA, uh, last week for a leadership offsite. So I'm all over the place and, uh, I'm trying to take the next few weeks to not travel and try to see my kids. So that's, uh, that's where I'm at right Ashley, now. Ashley, you, you gloss over it as if this is so easy, but a waste <laughs> software company, <laughs> I am so curious what that means. And you're sure. the founder of this company. How, how the yeah, heck I'm does one, the one become inspired to create waste management technology? So, so I'll keep my, like the rest of my, uh, <laughs> the rest of my professional journey short, but Majority of my experience is in financial services. Um, I ended up taking a job in real estate, which it didn't pan out. And so I was a little, I was scrambling. I had this like amazing career and I I took this opportunity with a friend and I ended up kind of getting, you know, uh, screwed over a bit. (laughs) So I, um, so I was kind of in a moment where I was scrambling. Um, I've always had these great jobs. I'm like, what do I do? And so I meet Mike, who's uh, who's our founder. And I was just like, okay, cool. This guy's nice. You know, he's he's also from Long Island. We're local. Seemed like a nice enough guy. He has four generations deep in the waste industry. And he's like, yeah, he just started a dumpster company in Brooklyn. And he was like, I'm just building technology for my waste company. So I was like, all right, whatever. Seems like a normal guy. I need a job. So I just went to work for him. Like, I, I don't have an ego. I didn't care that I've had, like, these really great positions. I'm like, whatever, we start over, right? And so, so I go to work for him. And pretty much right away, like we're we're yin and yang. Like he's your sales guy, your hype guy, your ideas guy. I'm your data person, your analytics process. So I'm kind of like reeling it in. I'm like, oh, okay, let's slow down. And uh, probably about a year in, we realized that we wanted to become a software company because we were like, we could be the most technologically advanced waste company in New York City or we could kind of uh, get the software out there and give it to other haulers. And so, yeah, 
we started working on this. We've been doing this for six, seven years. We've been building out this platform. Um, so COVID hits and I'm pregnant with my first daughter and we're home immediately, right? New York is like a super scary place to be. I'm terrified because I'm like pregnant for the first time. I'm like, I'm dying for sure. And, uh, and yeah, we, I was home immediately and all of our peers were stuck in the office because they were on desktop legacy software. Mm. So wow. we, yeah, yeah. So we kind of well, knew. I have a, I have a, before we get into the weeds of the story, which I can't wait to hear, there are two things that I believe if I'm wondering, maybe a lot of our listeners are wondering. Number one is who's your customer? Uh, this software sounds very compelling, almost like probably everyone should have it. So who's your typical customer? And that number two is, what can you do to fix the waste problem in New York? Oh my God. <laughs> I think everyone wants to know that question. Like, <laughs> yeah, the rat problem is getting pretty severe. I'm like, I'm trying to like avoid the city at all costs for now. Um, so, so our typical customer, so we have two products. So curb waste, um, which we went to market with, which I'll talk about later, but we went to market with um, officially January 2022. Um, and we, we ended up selling the waste business, right? So we were self-funding and then we ended up kind of going full software. So curb waste, um, is our flagship product and that's for waste haulers, right? So you have kind of like generation of waste. Um, and then you'll obviously, you know, the hauling of the waste, right? Picking up the waste and then the final kind of destination of where it ends up. And so this is for the hauling of the waste, right? So maybe you're working on a construction project you have a lot of debris, um, a hauler is going to come and pick up that waste and then bring it to a facility. And so this software curb waste is built for, for waste haulers. So it's a vertical SaaS product. It tackles their business end to end. So order management, customer management, dispatching, we have a mobile app for dis, uh, for drivers, um, inventory, automated billing, reporting, you name it. And it's a highly regulated in, uh, industry, right? And so it's very tricky. We're trying to learn all these new markets. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure, um, you know, in different states now to hit certain diversion metrics, sustainability. Um, and so we're trying to trying to figure that all out. <laughs> Ashley, hearing you describe your products and who you're serving and the complexities of navigating the politics and local governments and all of that. Clearly, you're an expert in this space, but to become an expert, you said something that really struck me uh, as an amazing human leader. And that's what this podcast is about. And you said, look, I had this wildly successful career in one industry. Mm. And then I didn't have an ego. Sometimes you have to start over. I just said, yeah, let's do it. But you say that so casually. And actually, I think that's something that everyone struggles with is this is what I'm worth. This is what I'm good at. This is what I can do. But Look at what that moment of humility has created for you in expertise and career and whole new world. Can we go back to that moment for a second and yeah. tell us a little bit more about that real decision making process? Because you said it was so casual, but I, I guess some of those natural human feelings were in there also. Yeah. So I I had like a really incredible career. I spent, you know, three years a city group out of college. I became a chief of staff only a year in, and they had me working in, this is post-financial crisis, right? So city, city wasn't, you know, doing the best. They were under a lot of pressure. We were on a hiring freeze. So really early on, I'm 23, I ended up in a like chief of staff role. Um, and I was working that and another role at the same exact time for a year and a half. I ended up leaving for a little bit to go to fashion. And so um, I wanted to do something creative. Uh, my, my creativeness was kind of itching, but I still wanted something analytical. So I've been comfortable with like changing. Um, and so went to fashion for a little bit, did, you know, went to Italy, did the whole, like I, I told Nadia, I, I, I worked for Laura Piana, so the Italian fashion house. So got to do that whole thing. Fashion week in Italy was really great. Um, and, You're speaking uh, her and language. I, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, Laura Piana, come on, everybody. It doesn't I get better dream than of owning one of their garments. <laughs> 
they're like so expensive. <laughs> yes, yes, I guess. I didn't even know what it was until um, until I interviewed and I'm like, oh God, it's like, I can only afford like the damaged, uh, the damaged stuff they're selling in the back. Um, <laughs> well, tell me where they are. I'm going to come with you to buy the yeah. damaged ones. I also moved and my husband lost one of my jackets and I'm like, <laughs> I was like, where is it? He's like, uh, he's like that was our retirement plan. Yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, so I was like, we're going to have to figure out how to get another one now. <laughs> my favorite jacket uh but yeah we'll, we'll wait a few more years uh I gotta wait for this business to pick up maybe I'll buy one retail um but uh yeah so I end up getting kind of real back into finance um and then into real estate my friend was the one who recruited me and then ended up kind of selling the business out from under everyone and, and you know it wasn't the best situation um so I've been comfortable with learning new industries it's never been an issue for me um I kind of just dive in. So for me, it was like, it was more so like a lot of steps backwards, right? I was kind of just back at this waste company, answering tele, like answering the phone, taking dumpster orders. (laughs) So it was like, okay. But you know, it was more just, I needed a job. Um, I was like, I'm going to figure it out. I've been able to learn other industries before. Um, You know, I was able to learn fashion super quickly. I was able to learn real estate. Um, Finance was already kind of like my bread and butter. But I was just like, okay, whatever, let's just try it. And and now, now we're a technology company and that's a whole other thing that I'm learning. And, um, you know, it's definitely very challenging because I'm customer facing, which I really haven't been, um, in my previous roles. Um, but yeah, it's, it was like kind of a do or die. I needed a job and I'm like, Mike seems great. I like what he's doing. Um, and I just kind of dove in and it, I, I got lucky. Like it, it, I got, I got lucky in this, in this situation that it worked out that way. Well, I salute your humble spirit, Ashley, because I know you're saying you've been lacking, but I also believe you worked your ass off, uh, <laughs> said very elegantly. And when we met, uh, at the customer success festival, I really admire how you leaned in. Like literally Ashley came to me and said, I would love to come on your podcast and this is the reason why. And I said, oh my God, I love it. And one of the things you said, we connected on being a woman in an industry that, you know, women maybe might not lean into, uh, you know, we would go probably somewhere else. So we're not expected to be in software and finance and like all of those cliche and stereotypes. So you've been breaking some pretty big ceilings there. And so I really loved how you pitched in. And I said, of course, like not even a question. So let's get you in. And I really, you know, I I really, I'm really curious to hear how did you become who you are, right? What gave you strength? What gave you energy? And then you said you prepared the story for us. And I want to hear what that story is. (laughs) Okay. You want to hear that now? Well, first I want to hear how you okay. became what you are. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so yeah, so I grew up on Long Island. Um, you know, I, my, I'm the first person in my family to go to college, actually. Um, so, you know, uh, my mom stayed at home. She's incredible. She's made so many sacrifices for us. Um, and my father was an entrepreneur. So from the time I was young, I had kind of seen that, you know, entrepreneurship journey um, and he came from nothing and kind of like me seeing that my whole life, it obviously motivated me. Um, But I've also just been very, it's just inside of me, if that makes sense. Um, I've always been internally motivated. So my parents be like, yeah, do that. Yeah. As long as you try with your grades, no problem. And like, I wanted to always do the best. Um, So it was just something like inside of me that I guess I've been born with. Um, so I, I started working when I was 14. Yeah. Four, no, 16. Yeah. I was, I was, so I had worked in real estate through, uh, through high school and the beginning of college, um, ended up going to Baruch and studying finance and I worked all through college. So I went to class two days a week and I worked the other three days a week. Um, so I've always been kind of hustling. Didn't necessarily expect to, you know, to be a co-founder, to be an entrepreneur, um, wasn't, maybe necessarily what I had planned, but 
um, Mike and I have a lot of similarities in that regard. And so, well, his- well, well, let me pause you there because if you say that was not necessarily what I had planned, what is it that you had planned? <laughs> I don't know. I probably figured I was going to be in like a nice big corporate job. You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I wasn't, I hadn't really, I moved around a lot. So I wasn't really sure. Most of my twenties, I was just kind of figuring out what I liked. Um, so I hadn't really planned anything specific. I was just trying jobs, doing well. And then I was like, okay, I'm moving on. Cause I wanted new challenges. Um, I'm not short of challenges today. So <laughs> fine. It's like, it's like, um, and yeah, especially something you said, Nadia, like on the software side, definitely, you know, uh, not a lot of women on the waste side, even less women. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm in a space where, you know, even with dealing with the customers, there's really not a lot of women, uh, you know, kind of leadership or women in general in the waste industry. Um, so it's been, you know, um, a lot to work through, but it's a really good challenge. And so have you had um, a moment where you've really noticed that um, obviously it would be visible from a day to day perspective, but is there a moment that sticks out to you where you've gone, wow, I'm the only one in the room or I think this went differently because I'm the only one in the room? Yeah, I think that um, our whole leadership team right now is uh, <laughs> is male, except for me. Um, so, you know, we do have a lot of like women in the company, um, but in the leadership, I'm the only one. So there are definitely moments where, you know, we're in a meet, we're in a meeting or, you know, maybe we were at an expo, we were at a happy hour. They're all talking about basketball. And I'm like, I don't really know what to do here, <laughs> like, you know, um, or you know, I, I just deal with different things, right? So like, oh, why'd you check a bag? Like, ah, I have a lot of stuff. I don't want my makeup to get thrown out, you know? So, uh, <laughs> so um, I, I know, I know. Nadia, I'm sure. They should work. see my bags. Oh my God, I know. <laughs> when they it's make like, those jokes, I, I'm going to open a very small parenthesis here. I was <laughs> flying to Munich 12 years ago. Maybe I was a little exaggerated in the baggage I was carrying, but who cares? And I remember there was this male director pointing out how big my suitcase was for the entire trip. I'm like, come on, y'all. Like, leave me alone. I can carry whatever the heck I want. I'm with you. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm with you, too. I know. So the India trip, um, you know, they were like, oh, how much are you going to bring? I'm like, it's a microaggression. That's a big, big trip. Um, But uh, yeah. So, you know, and that side of things, I mean, they're all incredible. Um, but it's just so different, you know, like we'll be on these trips, we'll be traveling and, you know, I want to, I don't want to just dive into happy hour. I want to stop in. I want to call my kid. Um, so some things like that can obviously be a little bit like challenging for me. Um, but it's okay. I, it doesn't really phase me much. So <laughs> I'm okay. I've been working in a lot of male dominated, um, industries, right. Finance. Um, so it doesn't really bother me. I think the resiliency that you have is amazing. And you mentioned there's a lot of women in your company. Think of the example that you're setting for them in terms of, look, you can be successful too. Here's how it goes. Um, I think that's, that's part of the beauty of it. Not only are you building success for your company and yourself, but you're emulating that as a leader for other people who are looking at you, whether they report to you or not. I mean, when you look up and see leaders who look like you, it's inspiring you know, to see them successful versus looking up and not seeing anybody, which, you know, you're holding it down here. It sounds like I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying my best. (laughs) And so tell us the story. (laughs) Okay. Um, So, yeah, so I know, right. You want to kind of hear about messy, messy uh, human experience or leadership. So, so I'll give you one. Um, (laughs) So, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, this is this is pretty much as messy as it gets, I think. Um, so yeah, really timely because it's about exactly a year ago, um, June 2022. So obviously, I'm at Curb Waste. Um, we're only six months into our official go to market um, on Curb Waste. At the time, you know, other than engineering, um, which obviously I don't know how to do, um, <laughs> we only had five employees, and I'm being pulled in every direction uh, imaginable. So building out our implementation processes, onboarding customers, handling tech support tickets, 
managing accounts post go live, doing design reviews, working on product requirements, um, you name it. And I'm working seven days a week, a lot of the time, 16 to 18 hour days. While I have all this going on, I'm also eight months pregnant <laughs> with my second daughter. So, um, and I have an almost two year old at home. So as the due date's approaching, um, I was super focused on setting up an implementation software so I could create more transparency, support business continuity while I was on leave. Um, so this was, she was due July 24th. So this is like exactly this timeline now, like I'd say mid June last year. Wow. Um, so I'm working insane hours. I'm trying to get this thing up and running. So it's like a repeatable process. So somebody can sort of backfill me. I'm like dreaming of this, like leave. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I'm working these hours. I have this like sneaky feeling she's going to come early. No idea why, but it was just like an intuition. Um, so I just, I kept telling her, like, I think she's going to come early. Um, so anyway, we get to the end of June. I work through the entire weekend to try to like make significant process, um, progress, I should say rather, um, on getting this, this software up and running um, so that the implementation process is really seamless for somebody else to take over. Um, so I work through the whole weekend. I start work on Monday and <laughs> so I'll never forget this. So I have back to back calls from 8 AM until it was like 1230. And by like 10 AM, I started having contractions and I'm like, okay. So I'm thinking maybe it's Braxton Hicks. I had a, I was induced the first time, so I'd never been in labor. So I don't really know what it feels like. And I'm there and I'm in my meetings and I'm literally having contractions. I'm still talking to people and I'm like, now I'm timing them. I text my husband. I'm upstairs. He's downstairs. Ah! <laughs> and I'm like, I think I might be in labor. He's like, no, no, you're fine. It's like, he was like, it's probably the doctor's appointment at one. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you'll be fine. I'm like, all right. Yeah, it's probably Braxton Hicks. I'm like, yeah, I, I think so too. They're getting worse. They're getting worse. By the time my final call happens at 1230, I'm in like immense pain. I'm still talking on these calls. And I'm like, yeah, I, I remember telling the person, like, I think I might have a kid today. They're like, really? I'm like, I don't know. So I get to the OB appointment at one and she's like, okay, what's going on? I'm like, it's a little bit of an active day. <laughs> she does the exam. I'm four centimeters. Hey. <laughs> she's like, I'm like, oh, serious. So, I swear. So. Oh my so gosh. I'm literally, I've been working through, uh, you know, back to back calls the whole morning while I'm like legit labor. And she's like, she's like, yeah, I think you're going to have this kid in the next like 24 hours. I'm oh like, my oh my God. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, great. Um, so I'm obviously panicking. She's like, oh, if the contractions get to 10 minutes within 10 minutes for an hour, you have to go to the hospital. They were three minutes apart. I scramble, I like run back to the house. I had nothing packed. Um, I was at my in-laws. I say goodbye to my daughter and my older daughter and we rush to the hospital. Um, she comes six hours later. So obviously I'm scrambling in panic when I get home because I have nothing ready for her. No bottles, no clothes, like set up, nothing put together. Um, and I also have all this work that I thought I had four more weeks. Uh, to and you have on. a two years old. I mean, the second pregnancy is so hard because you have your little, the little <laughs> monkey that wants to be with you. And yet there you are with this huge bump. Yes. I'm with you. I yes. am with you. I have two daughters, everyone. You're listening. Yes. I'm speaking from a position of knowledge. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, and I'm like, I had thought, you know, I had this feeling, but I also was hopeful. Like, I'm like, no, I have four more weeks to execute on everything. Um, but the truth of the matter is the business needs just, they simply don't stop. Right. And I didn't really feel that um, truly until this moment. Um, the fact of the matter was we had just closed our seed round of, you know, investment. I had a whole team I had to hire underneath me. I had customers waiting to be onboarded because they thought I was going to be around. Um, we still had like product stuff I had to work on. Um, and you know, I'm trying to build out this whole implementation process, um, for my team for when, you know, I return back to work. So within a week, um, of giving birth, I was back to work. Um, <gasps> yeah. So not officially like online, like I wasn't on Slack, but I was working full days, um, to get these things done in the background, play catch up, um, before I officially returned. So training customers, <sighs> doing interviews, working on building out this, uh, this wow. onboarding software, and I had a bunch of family members on rotation um, watching her. 
yeah, while I was working. Um, so yeah, I spent barely any time in my leave with my baby, most of the time just working, physically recovering. Um, and it was heart wrenching for me. I, I sat there five of the six weeks of my leave, leave, um, you know, hearing her cry. I, I live in New York, so I don't have that much space so I could hear everything. Um, so hearing her cry, wanting to hold her, put her to sleep and there just weren't enough hours in the day for it. Um, so yeah, as a co-founder, I have the responsibility to the, you know, to the business to keep it moving, keep things forward, regardless, obviously of having a child. Um, and like I said, the business needs don't stop. So this was a, a moment where my work life and personal life collided, uh, in a very unexpected way with her coming early, me not having my contingency plan in place because she came early. Um, but it may have happened anyway, because of the nature of the business and the stage at which we're at. Um, so I returned after six weeks, not fully, you know, mentally ready, feeling overwhelming sense of guilt, um, around missing that time with her. Also, I missed a lot of time with my older daughter, those last like few moments I would, would have had kind of alone with her. Um, and just an overall lack of confidence in my physical appearance as well. And so, um, yeah, I returned after six weeks and I'm still working through it to this day. Wow, Ashley, you said I'll never forget this. And yeah, of course not. This sounds traumatic to go through. What is the what is the message of this story when you say it out loud and think back on this? What is the message to you about this? I think that, you know, I'm super lucky. Um, both my husband and I are born in New York and we've like dabbled at the concept of leaving. And I think it's the support system for me, you know, like it's hard, it's super hard to be a leader, super hard to be a parent, it's extremely hard to be both. Um, and then especially being a mom. Um, and so for me, you know, having a support system, I think was so key, so critical. Um, I had my mom, my mother-in-law, it happened to be summer. So my aunt was off because she works in a school. So I got lucky. So I had her and then my husband tried to um, tried to take off some time as well. So I had just this group of people supporting me like on rotation. So it wasn't as though it was like a stranger watching my kid because that actually would have crushed me. Um, so I was like, okay, this is family. These are people that love her that, you know, she's, she loves. And um, so for me, it was this endless support system that I have that made me get through this. How is this experience shaping you as a leader? Um, as you said, you're the co-founder. There are other women in the company that they might be looking at you for the company is actually handling uh, all of the systems that impacts them. And maybe people that might not have a similar support system or that they might be alone uh, you know, New York is a place of immigrants. So how this whole experience is um, inspiring you? Yeah, so I think um, I definitely think that I'm showing the team like a level of resilience, like everybody in the company is like, <laughs> like this girl's like over the top. Um, but uh, I, I'm definitely showing them resilience. I think um, I just actually started a couple months back um, a women's group. So I actually had a, a meeting right before this one um, with all the women on the team um, because I want to make sure that I'm helping support them as much as I can. Um, most of the people in the, most of the women in the company don't have children yet. Um, so I haven't like come across that yet. Um, but I think it's not, I don't want to say like you can have it all. I, it's cliche. Um, there's sacrifices that have to be made right? So I chose to be a co-founder, right? It's a choice I made. I, I could have just had like a cushy corporate job. That's totally a choice I could have made. I chose this um, for, you know, my career advancement, for our financial security, for all these different reasons. Of course, like with my kids in mind, um, knowing there's like sacrifices. And so um, it's tricky, you know, I mean, definitely the team will tell me to slow down or take a break or in this case from this week, maybe take a rest. Um, so I do try, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot to match. I'm still working through it to this day, to be honest. Like she's going to be one, um, in three weeks. And so a lot of the emotions are, are coming back to me now. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I'm hoping I'm a, I'm a good role model for them in terms of 
showing the other um, women within the company that they can still push through, they can, um, you know, be super successful, and they can have a family. Um, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but, but it's possible. Ashley, it's, I think you are absolutely showing folks that, that you can push through. I also think there's some who would say, is that what pushing through looks like? Is that the only version of pushing through? And I'm curious for your take, you know, when other folks are in this situation, is this something that you would feel like cautionary tale, don't do it like that? Or yes, with a support network, you can stay laser focused on everything that matters. Yeah, I think um, definitely if someone didn't have a support system, I think it would be extremely challenging um, to do what I did. Um, obviously, it wasn't like it wasn't like this was my first choice. Of course, I wanted to like be there, spending time with her, taking care of her, and I still feel guilty. Like, what could the future impact of that be on her? Um, but you know, I if I was lucky enough to have a support system, and that's why it worked for me. Um, that's why I've also chosen to try to stay local so that I have that system in place. Um, but yeah, without a support system, I totally agree. It would have been impossible for me. Um, yeah, here's what, uh, what is resonating with me among the things you said, given that I feel so much for you because having had two deliveries, I mean, my brain didn't start functioning until, I don't know how many months later, you know, I come from Europe where most of my girlfriends took one year of maternity leave. And when I was back after I I interviewed for my role here in America that my daughter had two months, already that was considered, oh my God, you're crazy. (laughs) And, and, And so the word that you said that clicked with me is intention. And especially for women, and especially when it comes to systems, systems meaning corporate systems, regulations, um, knowing what a woman goes through from a hormonal perspective, postpartum depression, complications. There's so many stories out there. Uh, We treat giving birth as if it was like a walk in the park. But to this day, there are women that die Mm -hmm. from giving birth. So it's still a very traumatic experience. Um, And I, I, I love that you said intention because it's about the freedom and the choice that a woman should have in treating that event in a way that honor what she is. You want to work the same week that you are delivering the baby? Please do, because if that helps you in feeling that you have value, it's your company, you're the co-founder. Oh my God, I'm so happy that you got that um, structure around you, Ashley. And and for all of the others that might be listening that don't have that or that they might have other needs, it's the intention to say, what's my plan? Do I want to stay? Do I need more time? Then you got to be in a system that allows you to do mm-hmm. that. Because what I fear, and, and for me, the most terrible thing that can happen is for someone to having to play to a system that doesn't meet what they need to yep. go through that. Absolutely. So, and this is a very polarizing topic, of course. Um but I love that you were able to go through that moment in the way that you did. What what a what an amazing situation. Yeah, I think struggle. So I don't want to underestimate. No, no, no. It's so goals. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's listen, I think um I don't I try to look at the positive side of it, right? Because a lot of people would want to be in my situation, right? A lot of people would kill to be a female co-founder at a software company. So um, I try to reframe it and say like, okay, well, I have to push the business forward um, so that it's possible for these other people to do things like this as well, right? And um, I hope, right, we obviously have raised more money. I'm hoping we, you know, we have more staff now. So, um, So future people within our company, I would love to build out 
um, you know, a plan that people uh, have a little bit more time. It wasn't necessarily, I chose this, um, you know, but you know, that's the responsibility that I bear. But it also, all that time that I've spent, right, working through a pregnancy, I ended up in the hospital when I was pregnant. I was dizzy for 10, uh, tw- uh, eight weeks and couldn't walk. And I was still visiting customers. Like I made a lot of sacrifices, um, missing out with time with my older daughter, this crazy stressful pregnancy. And then, um, and then afterwards. And so I had to push through because it has to all be worth it, right? All the sacrifices I've made have to be worth it. And so it just wasn't like, I couldn't give up. I had to make sure that the business was going to keep moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think your, your constant awareness of, I chose this, this is, this is the room. That's very inspiring to me because in my life, and I have not had a moment at all like what you have had. And so my sympathy is extremely high and my empathy is, is just (laughs) very low, but it's, I feel for you in in the ways that I can, but I have a hard time sometimes connecting that cause and effect of my own decisions. And I think that's a part of of the human condition, honestly, is, you know, it's easy to become a victim of something, to become a, and to, to have such a awareness of, okay, here are the things that I'm doing. These are the things that came out. Now I'm going to do them this way. And these are the things that, I I would guess that that's a secret to success for you. And I'm curious what you think of that. But your sense of I'm in the driver's seat, I will create the success that I envision for myself yeah. is both inspiring to listen to and I think a secret weapon for you. What do you think? I didn't really, I've never thought about it that way, but <laughs> you might be right. Yeah, I think uh, it's it happens in my everyday choices, right? This example I gave this of course, the biggest example I think that'll happen in my life. Um, knock on yeah. wood, please. Yeah, yeah, knock on wood. Um, <laughs> knock on wood, but it's crazy things always happen to me. But um, but yeah, I think every day, right? Like it's a choice of like working a little bit later or like staying up with my kids or whatever. I ha- You know, I'm, I travel a lot as well. Um, so I'm away from them a lot. So it's like, I will sacrifice, I will take red eyes you know, everybody else like, Oh, we're just going to fly. I'll take red eyes. So I'm home the next morning to be with my kid, you know, like, so I'll do everything I can to, to make it all work. I want them to, you know, I, I have such a close relationship with them. I love them to death. I want to be around for them, but at the same time, like I have to build this business. And I think it's an important lesson to teach them as well. Um, they can do anything they can push forward as well. And I want to, um, model that for them while also trying to make time for them. So it's a very tricky balance, but um, yeah, it might be my secret weapon. I, I, I don't really <laughs> slow down. So yeah. Um, well, yeah. Ashley, I can say that, you know, I, I truly wish you all the best from all fronts because you are living life with zeal, how I say it and grit <laughs> uh, for all the things you want to create. And I do also wish you, though, to take care of your elf. Yes, and, I will. And to love Ashley, because I know you're building something incredible and, and you're leading your family and your company. But I wouldn't want you to do that at the expense of your elf. So <laughs> yeah, my, my true wish for you is to be happy, honestly, and healthy and with long lives so that you can get all that you want. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Ashley, when you reflect on this, we always end by uh, just asking you to reflect on the conversation we just had, the story you just shared, and what message do you want to leave folks with off of this? What's the lesson that is Ashley's lesson off of off yeah. of this conversation? Yeah, so I think, I mean, definitely, you know, uh, if you can get a good support system, I think that's so critical. Um, I think I didn't even think about this, but now that you've said it, obviously being conscious of your choices as well, to your point, Nadia, like if you don't have a support system, maybe, you know, a a more corporate job does make more sense, right? You have to also be realistic um, with the choices that you make. And so I made this choice. I understand that that's going to mean sacrifice and not see my kids. But the message overall for me 
um, is just being kind to yourself and being forgiving to yourself. Um, you know, I think I could live every day with this overwhelming sense of guilt. Oh my God. And, but you know, I mean, they're probably not going to remember this, but regardless, it's more in my head. And I know that, um, but it's more just forgiving yourself. All these different, we have all these different, you know, uh, social media, all this noise, all these opinions on things. But at the end of the day, you know, what's right for yourself, for your family, for your career. So I think, you know, we all make mistakes and we all, I, and, and I don't consider this a mistake, like, but, um, but I think it's just being kind, like with the weight loss, like I was so stressed going back to work so early, I'm still trying to lose this weight from this baby. And it's like, my husband's like, just be kind to yourself. Like you're doing so much. Like my doctors are like, it's just not the time. Like you will, you'll get back. Um, so I think that's what I would say is just when you're going through a leadership journey, be kind to yourself, be forgiving to yourself. Mm, I love that. Very amazing. Cool. Yeah, that's a great takeaway. Thank you so much, <laughs> Ashley. Really great conversation. Appreciate the time. Thank uh, you so much for having me. Take this care. We will we will be in touch. Okay, yeah. awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. 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 Wow. That was a, a, a fantastic and very intense conversation. I'm glad that you called out the, you know, this is a this is a big topic. This is a trigger topic for a lot of people. I didn't see that coming. Uh, so I was not prepared, uh, if I have to be very honest, uh, because this is a topic that is very dear to my heart, uh, deeply. Not that all of the topics that we cover are not, but as a woman that had two pregnancies, went to postpartum depression both times with very traumatic births, uh, I was really feeling for her when she was giving that description. I was like, whoa. On calls with contractions at the office, with contractions that are painful, powering through this is a level of intensity that i don't think we have heard yet on 99 humans i couldn't be on my couch when i started having contractions <laughs> like, i started i went to the hospital like five times and they were sending me home again say come back come back and i was like i'm dying you all <laughs> what would i come back i'm dying save me get the baby out uh, yeah okay um well as always, uh, the question is, what are you taking away from that discussion, Nadia? Um, I'm going to start by saying that my wish for America is that <laughs> maternity leave, yeah. parental leave, any sort of leave related to building a family becomes au pair with the standards that the rest of the world has as an aside for the italian system you mentioned it but it is government regulated right like this is something that is not left to companies to be kind or to not be kind this is this is what we expect in this country yes now uh, not only so th this is a very slippery slope and i want to call this out because there are countries in Europe where a parental leave or maternity leave, how we want to call it, can go up to three years. Wow. And I've had several conversations with a lot of people, and, and then I will get to my takeaway, because it can be seen in, in, uh, in both ways. It can be either I am making a parent a service by offering so much leave, or if a parent is taking that much leave because there's no support system and there's no daycares and there's no uh, family, they're going to be out of the workforce because let's face it, if you stay out three years to take care of your baby, you know, that has an impact. I have girlfriends in Germany that luckily they have financial resources and so they were able to hire support, but there's no daycare, for yeah. example, for them. Uh, my girlfriend tells me it's only basically all moms that are looking after their children until there are three to four years. I want to hear your takeaway, but this topic is it's just rising such a natural 
discussion about the cultural differences because you are Italian and I am American and in the US there's almost this pride about how hard we work and the hustle culture and the idea of giving multiple years off governmentally regulated for having a baby I think most Americans think about that and go well no wonder the US has such a big GDP because we're working a whole lot harder and part of me as an American actually feels that where I'm like yeah I'm glad we work hard. But then you hear a story like this. I'm like, this is too hard. This is working too hard. We really need to control so that we have a little bit more of a cushion around this very difficult physical and emotional experience of having a baby. Which is why this connects very well to my takeaway of what Ashley said, which is the intention. Mm. I loved that when I was two months on my leave, I was able to do an interview. That was my choice. So now, granted that in Italy, the five months are mandatory for everybody. But look at the French system. The French system is amazing. Moms have the five months. They take it. But there's so many options that you can set up to have your child being taken care of that you have ways to move forward. Mm. So for me, the ideal scenario is a scenario where you as an individual, mom, dad, adoption, surrogacy, any of the ways that are available to build a family out there can benefit from choice. And choice means that like Ashley, if I am a co-founder and I know the price that I'm paying and I have my mom here that can help me with my baby, I'm going to be okay with that. Uh, and then I work through my forgiveness and managing my sense of guilt and all that. But what really worries me, Jeff, is when a woman doesn't have the option. Yeah. That is what worries me. Because when I think of when I delivered my babies, my mom, rest in peace, was already passed away. I was living in another country. And thank goodness, I was able to have a full-time help. So if a woman doesn't have that in a country like America, what can they do? Mm. Yeah. What is your takeaway? Well, it's, I think the outside of, what you have said, which resonates with me. And I love that. And I think you are such an incredible woman. And I'm glad that you had the support that, that you needed going through this. Because I feel for people who don't. And I actually think that's more often than not the case. So it's an important takeaway that you're calling out. I would actually go before that piece of the story. Mm. Because I really did appreciate how humility shaped her career because I sometimes think of humility as a desirable leadership trait. Someone is more vulnerable. Someone is more able to connect with other people. Someone is aware of their humanity despite a lot of success. And those are all nice things to have once you've already made it in quotes, maybe. Hmm. But the way Ashley added to that was the way that humility built a successful career, the way that humility unlocked new opportunities for her, the advantages of the humility that she had. And I think that was a really powerful reminder of additional reasons that being humble can really work for you. Because uh, I, I generally, I find that to be a trait that's wonderful. Now, of course, there's people who are too humble and need to own their greatness much more. And there's plenty of the other side of the coin to even that. But I will say that for those who maybe humility doesn't come as naturally for, to mm -hmm. remember that it can also spark new opportunities mm -hmm. is a really fantastic reminder. I love it. It's a very difficult one. And as you said, sometimes the ones that shouldn't be humble are the most humble. And sometimes those there are, you know, the opposite will be like, hey, <laughs> you know, reality check. So yeah. I really like that you call it out. Well, what a conversation. It's great to see you as always, Nadia. Until next time. Right. It's great seeing you. And as a reminder, everybody, feel free to visit our website, 99humans.com, where you can find all of the episodes that have been published until today. 
connect with us on LinkedIn, either Jeff and I or our company page, and you can find our episodes in any streaming platform. Give us a five star, and we're so happy that you listen to us. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.